welcome everybody um, to uh, this 2020 Gorman Lectures. It's a real pleasure to uh, be here to welcome you and introduce you uh, to this year's lectures jointly organized by the IFS Deaton Review of Inequalities and CREAM at UCL. I hope you can all, uh, all hear me. Our speaker, Daron uh, Samoglu, hardly needs any introduction. One of the most influential and prolific economists in the world. Daron's work addresses many of the key challenges facing society and the economy. His work has produced new insights in political economy, development, growth, technology and inequality, human capital and labor economics. From the leading papers on training and wages and on productivity and unemployment in the early 1990s through to the remarkable work on technology and labor markets and on the role of the state and democratic institutions in driving economic growth and inequality. It's a remarkable stream of work. I know we're gonna hear much more on his work on automation and inequality in the lectures today and tomorrow. Daron is an ideal choice for the Gorman Lectures. These lectures are named after the economist Terence Gorman, who was a key influence in the direction taken by the economics department at UCL in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Daron is the kind of economist Gorman would have really admired. Inspirational and equally at home with theory and with empirics. Indeed, Darren, you may remember that you presented at the Applied Seminar at UCL in the early 1990s, I think while still completing your PhD at LSE. Well, I can tell you, Gorman saw the paper and couldn't stop talking about it. Darren's contributions have been recognized, recognized in every possible way, from his election to fellow of all the major academic societies, Economic Society and others, and winners of the major awards, including the Bates Clark Medal, the Nemers Prize, the Lafcon Prize, and many more. Before I hand the floor, or I should say the Zoom screen perhaps to Darren, I want to thank Maria at Cream and Ramin in the department for their fantastic help in putting this together. And Maria, who continues to monitor everything as we go along. Also to Princeton University Press, who sponsored the lecture. Of course, it's a big shame that we can't all be together in London. We would indeed be in the Gustav Tuck Theatre in the UCL building just behind me here. Uh, but we're getting used to the new normal and it's working pretty well. We'll have about 10 minutes at the end of each of the lectures for questions. If you wish to ask a question, do let me know through the Slido system, at the, which you'll have been sent a link, uh, what, that you'd like to ask a question and what you'd like to ask, and I'll try and monitor that in the, for the questions at the end of the lecture. So welcome everyone again, and thank you, Darren, for giving these lectures. Darren, the uh, Zoom screen is yours for the first Gorman lecture on tasks, automation, and the labor market. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. It's a, a great pleasure uh, to be joining you, albeit via Zoom. Uh, Richard stole one of my, or one and a half of my beginning <laughs> sentences. You know, the first one is that it's a great honor to be giving the Gorman lectures because Gorman is one of my favorite economists, uh, precisely because of his amazing use of theory in the service of understanding data and aggregating from data to macroeconomic implications, but only rigorously doing it from micro up. And second, uh, it's a great homecoming to UCL for me. I have been in there once before, but the very first presentation that I have given on innovation and labor markets was at UCL. And Richard was the instigator again. He invited me. I don't know how, you know, he knew about me when I was a PhD student at, at the LSC. And that, that, was, uh, that, that was a paper that, uh, you know, 
was the beginning of my interest in uh, innovation training in perfect labor markets. And uh, today it's a related theme, a little bit different. As uh, Richard said, it's about tasks, automation and the labor market. And both of the lectures draw very, very heavily on my work with Pascual Restrepo. There have been major shifts against labor in both the US and several other advanced economies. And one summary measure of these shifts is the aggregate labor share, how much of national income goes to labor that's shown here with the dashed gray line or when you composition adjusted for GDP with the red line, both of them show sharp declines. And the red one shows that this has nothing to do with the composition of GDP shifting from one sector to another, it's really a within sector change. There has been a lot written on this. Some have argued that capital deepening is important markups. We heard Jan Eckhout's important work today, earlier in the Gorman conference, Monopsony. Uh, we've uh, seen Attila Lidner's uh, work on this, for example. But what I'm going to argue today, based on my work with Pascual, that this is actually even more closely connected to something that has somewhat received less attention, changing task content of production. But before I jump there, let me show a couple of the major implications of this shifts against labor. And part of the reason I'm doing this is because I want to lay the scene and put some of the major changes in labor markets. Again, I'm gonna show data from the US, a few uh, figures from other countries, just to keep it uh, more uh, focused. But these are well-known patterns, but they're not always linked to these shifts against labor. And I'm going to argue by the end of today's lecture that they are actually much more closely related. So this one is uh, a figure that many of you have seen before. It's the changes in real wages of different demographic groups in the United States. So uh, these are cumulative changes. So they're showing how real wages are evolving over time by five education groups and two gender groups. And uh, in the 60s is when the higher quality CPS data starts. The same is true before in the 50s and the late 40s as well. You see a pattern of broadly shared prosperity where real wages for all 10 uh, demographic groups are increasing of about 10, uh, about 2% a year. But then from the late 1970s and especially early 1980s, you have a huge fanning out between the higher education and the lower education groups, but much more consequentially, especially in terms of its social implications, you also see a sharp drop in the real wages of low education workers, especially low education men, as you can see from these uh, orange and red lines. So significantly lower real wages in the 1990s and 2000s for high school or high school graduate, high school dropout or high school graduate men than we had in the 1970s or early 1980s. One way in which economists have thought about this is through skill bias technological change. And today, again, in the Gorman conference, we have seen many models that were, in some sense, souped up versions of skill bias technological change. I'm go I, have, I have contributed to the debate and to the literature on skill bias technological change in my own way, but over the last 15 years or so, I have grown more and more convinced that skill bias technological change is only a small part of the uh, equation when we are looking at these broad trends. Of course, I'm not sure that I can convince all of you of that, but at least I will make a case for that by the end of today's lecture. But this picture from the Handbook of Labor Economics chapter that I wrote with David Otter is one of the exhibits. If skill bias technological change is a major driver of what's going on in labor markets, then we should expect that there should be greater wish by firms to employ more skilled workers. So to look at that, we rank all occupations by skills, either mean wage or skills doesn't make much difference. And then we look at the changes in the employment of these occupations over three periods, 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s until the Great Recession. So this has nothing to do with the financial crisis. 
So in the 1980s, the red curve here, there is a little bit of an evidence of that or quite a bit of evidence of that. The higher is the skill percentile of an occupation, the more its employment grows. This is an indication that firms are indeed trying to hire more of the skilled occupations and fill skilled tasks. And again, I'm already planting the language of tasks, which I'm gonna come to in a second. But the pattern looks very different in the 1990s, this uh, blue line. Here you have an inverse U shape. There is a negative growth in the middle occupations, clerical and production occupations, blue color occupations, and higher at the low, uh, higher growth at the bottom and at the top. But the 2000s are even stranger. There is no evidence of higher skills getting greater employment growth. In fact, it's the bottom of the occupational skill distribution that's showing the fastest growth. Now, the pattern with real wage declines that I just show you here is US specific, a little bit of it in the UK as well. That's because real wage protection for workers at the bottom are very weak in the US and they have become weaker over time. But the general technological and occupational changes are very common across countries. So here we are looking at the distribution of employment growth between the early 1990s and mid, I mean, 2000s for all, all, most of the OEC European and the, US economy, and the US in comparison. And what you are seeing is that just like the US picture I showed you for the 1990s, all of these countries are showing a contraction of employment in the middle paying occupations against production, blue collar and clerical occupations and an expansion either at the top or at the bottom or in both in some countries. So the patterns that I'm going to be showing you today are not US specific, but the way in which they translate into wages is very much institutions dependent. And I'll come back to that at the very end of tomorrow's lecture. So the rest of today's lecture is going to have a theory component and an empirical component. First, I'm going to present a new, somewhat new, I mean, it's not that new, it's been taking, uh, developing over the last uh, two and a half decades, but relatively new framework for thinking about labor market effects, working through tasks, and highlighting why this, this framework has very different implications for real wages, employment, and labor demand and technology than, uh, than, than the standard canonical framework with factor augmenting technologies. And I'm also going to show you why labor share is really at the center of this framework. So I will try to link everything to the labor share and hence the shifts against labor are really not a separate phenomenon are the same phenomenon that I'm gonna be emphasizing throughout this lecture. And then finally, I will clarify the link between rising inequality and the shifts against labor and the task content. Empirically, I will give you a lot of data on where the labor share declines in the US is coming from, both within, both across sectors and within sectors, and then show you the links between this and the automation technologies, first at a correlational level, then a little bit more trying to get to a causal estimate, then at the firm level using French data, which we don't have yet for the US data, it's being collected right now, hopefully most of what I'm showing you for France, we will be able to do in the next year and a half for the US as well. And then finally, the inequality parts empirically. Okay. So <clears throat> let me, highlight what I mean by the task-based framework. Automation is one of the central ideas I want to communicate in this context. Automation has been very common in history. It's not a new phenomenon. And it is the best exhibit for us to understand why a task-based framework is important. 
machines and computers have been used throughout the last 200 years for substituting for human labor. You see this on agriculture at horse-powered reapers, harvesters, threshing machines. In manufacturing, especially over the last 100 years, machine tools replacing labor-intensive technologies, both uh, first in the artisanal sense and then on the factory floor uh, com com uh, connected with the assembly line. More recently, since the 1980s, we have industrial robotics. Uh, before then, the dedicated machinery, such as numerically controlled machinery, automating welding, machining, assembly, uh, knitting, packaging, and so on. And then, of course, software-based automation and more algorithmic automation that started with databases and, uh, and clerical jobs in the 1980s again and has been accelerating. Now, the task-based framework would be incomplete if I just talked about these aspects and not new tasks where labor has a comparative advantage. But the way that I have divided things is that I'm not going to talk about new tasks today. I'm going to do it. Uh, I'm going to do it uh, extensively tomorrow. So those of you who want to think about new tasks, hold your horses. We'll have a lot more to say on that because that's my favorite topic. So, of course, whatever uh, feature of labor markets and technology we talk about, our instinct, the way that we've been taught in graduate school and sometimes in undergraduate, is to start with the simplest aggregate production function representation. And it would look something like this. Why a sectoral or aggregate output is a function of uh, <coughs> L times AL, AL is technology that's labor augmenting, K times AK. Now, this is what I mean by the canonical framework, or when we come to inequality, we would also have AH, AH times H for the skilled worker. But uh, a lot of what I'm going to say today is based on the presumption, which I'm going to try to uh, 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 justify, that this is not a good place to start. First of all, this framework lacks descriptive realism. What I described in the previous slide in terms of technolo technology's effects of enabling labor being substituted by machines or algorithms cannot be understood in this framework. But even more fundamentally, <clears throat> uh, this framework doesn't help us think about how task services are being allocated to different factors. And that, I think, is going to be quite important. Moreover, as I'll come back and highlight in a second, this has some strange implications. First of all, it implies that technological change makes capital and labor uniformly more productive in all tasks. I know of no evidence, no historical example that would justify that. And it also has some very strange comparative statics. For example, all kinds of technological changes always increase wages or increase labor demand. It has one other one, which is that labor share effects of technologies depends on the elasticity of substitution, some things I always had a hard time getting my head around. But then I understood that it was only partially my problem. It was also a problem of this framework. It's really not a natural way of thinking about things. All right. So instead, what I'm going to argue is that we need a richer way of thinking about technology. And the key thing here is going to be the task content of production, this orange thing. And we need to keep track of this task content of production. But I'm not going to posit this production function. I'm going to start from the micro, just like Gorman would have liked, and then aggregate up to the macro. All right. So I'm going to do that uh, in a way that hopefully is most familiar to people. So here is the way I'm going to do it. Let me take a single sector, or you can take an economy that's a, a, produced a single good. And I'm going to say that this good is produced by combining task services across a continuum of tasks. For reasons that will become clearer in tomorrow's lecture, I'm going to let that continuum of uh, unit measure continuum to run from n minus 1 to n. And the way that I'm going to make this as standard as possible so that you can <coughs> use insights from monopolistic competition or trade theory is make these things uh, 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 Dixit Stiglitz, so constant elasticity of substitution. But sigma here is not the usual sigma. It's the elasticity of substitution between tasks. And then I'm assuming that these tasks are ranked from 
more capital friendly to more labor friendly and those below i so this i here sorry this i here those below i are technologically automated so what that means is that they can be produced by capital if you so wish and if they are produced by capital capital may have different productivity but its elasticity of substitution within task is infinite with labor okay again that's a simplification all do you need is that its elasticity of substitution is greater oops what happened here uh, is greater than the elasticity of substitution between tasks but let me take it infinite so in particular what you can see here is that why is it doing this Okay, so once a task is automated, this is how it can be produced. I have included the AL and the AK so that I can allow for factor augmenting technologies and contrast them with what I want to emphasize. But more importantly, I also have these gammas. These are task specific productivity. So Matthias, for example, mentioned task bias technological change those would be the gamma l the gamma k's except that he had multiple types of labor which is something i'm going to have at the end of this lecture so far it's just a single type of labor but if a task is not automated it's in this i n region then you can not do anything other than produce it by labor and throughout i'm going to assume that there's a simple comparative advantage structure, gamma L over gamma K is increasing in Z. That's the sense in which high index tasks are more labor friendly. Okay, this is not so complicated, but I'm going fast. So it's actually useful to see it in a graph. So what I'm showing you here is the task space going from zero or N minus one doesn't matter to N. I is where automation threshold is here and i'm showing you the costs of producing each task with different factors so these tasks here to the right can only be produced by labor so their cost of production is just the real wage divided by the productivity of labor in those tasks on the left i can produce with capital or labor so for a capital, it's the user cost of capital R divided by the productivity of capital and the same thing for labor. So in this case, on the left, capital is cheaper than labor. So you would like to allocate all of the tasks below I to capital. If it were feasible, some of the tasks to the right of I, you may have liked to allocate to capital as well, but that's not feasible. So now in this context, let's look at what technological change does. Here is what labor augmenting technological change is. It uniformly makes labor more productive. Again, I think it's a very weird type of technological change, if, I, if you ask my opinion. And I'm curious to hear, of course, other people's reactions to this. Now, if you have the type of task bias technological change, but just happening within this region, that would be similar to as well. This is what, for example, what Matthias was talking about earlier, for those of you who were in the conference, like for example, labor would be more productive here in those tasks. It would have similar, not exactly identical effects to labor augmenting. It would be less unrealistic because we have many examples of labor becoming more productive in a subset of tasks rather than in all of the tasks. And so there are some connections between that and this. Capital becoming more productive. Now we have the uh, capital cost shift down. And again, the shaded area is the cost savings because of that. But I actually would argue that a lot of the historical examples I mentioned, and certainly there are examples of task bias technological change affecting just capital or labor, but a lot of the historical examples that I'm talking about doesn't fit into either of these. Instead, it involves technological changes making it feasible to automate meaning to use capital in tasks that were previously labor intensive so that would be a shift from i oops 
to I prime. And the productivity gains from that are actually much smaller. Why? Because the productivity gains aren't due to capital becoming more productive in everything. It's just the gap between the cost of capital and labor. All right. So now let me put everything back together, solve the allocation of capital and labors uh, to task. And then you end up with a production function that's, oh, that takes the form of what I promised at the beginning. Oops. Output as a function of labor and capital. It looks very similar to the standard CES. Sigma, the elasticity of substitution, plays the role of the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor. That's not actually always the case. The capital, elasticity of capital between capital and labor is a little different than sigma, but in this simple case where I took uh, the I took the allocation of capital to be stop at i, it takes that simple form. But most importantly, there is this new set of economic forces captured by the orange terms. Those are the ones that capture the task content of production. They take the place of something that is quite boring in the CES production function, and we generally drop it, which are the distribution parameters of the CES. Now that those distribution parameters become endogenous. And that depends on both the comparative advantage, the elasticity of substitution, and most importantly, at these automation and new task thresholds. One way of understanding that there are some quite different forces than those that are emphasized in the standard theory is to look at the key object here, which is the labor share. So this is the form that the labor share takes. Again, I'm going a little bit faster than deriving these equations, but I think deriving the equations here would have been a little boring. So you'll just have to uh, trust me that we solved this one correctly. And labor share this takes this form here. Now it's color coded for a specific purpose. The blue and the orange terms are almost separable, or as in this exam in this example, they're fully separable. They capture different forces and they don't even interact. The blue one is everything that happens in a factor augmenting technology canonical framework. Either factor productivities uniformly increase, or perhaps for other reasons, capital or labor become cheaper or more expensive, for example, supply chains. Those are all in the blue. And one thing that's critical here, it takes the form of task substitution. So going back to this figure here, what happens if I make capital more productive? I produce more of the tasks that are capital intensive, but I'm not changing the allocation of tasks between capital and labor. So all of the effects of changes in factor prices or factor augmenting technologies are mediated by the elasticity of substitution. In contrast, this gamma term captures the task content of production. It's essentially the ratio of this term to this term. And critically, it doesn't depend on the elasticity of substitution. Now, or it does depend, but not, not in the same way. And I'm going to come back to some of the implications of this, both mathematical and substantive. But for now, this term here, of course, looks a little complicated. It's got integrals and lots of things flying around. So you don't need to remember that. Instead, you can focus on the special case where the elasticity of substitution is approximately 1, or gamma L or gamma K are equal to 1 or constant. Then the task content of production is simply N minus I. So new tasks increase the labor content of production and increases in automation threshold, I reduce the labor content, labor task content of production. But the most important lesson from this slide is that 
task substitution and task content work very differently, the orange term versus the blue term. All right, now implications for labor demand. As I said, it's all gonna be mediated by the labor share. So to do that, let's write a comprehensive measure of labor demand, wage bill. And that's of course, by definition is equal to output times labor share. For now, I'm ignoring markups and other non-competitive elements. Those are important, but I'll come back to them later. And I'm also postponing a discussion of inequality of single type of labor. Again, I'll come back to that later. Let's now take this equation here and let's differentiate both sides of this equation with respect to I, the automation threshold, or log differentiate, sorry, semi-log differentiate so that we wanna see how much WL, the wage bill, changes proportionately when we change the automation threshold. That's going to work through the chain rule via two effects, the effect on output and the effect on the labor share. That's what I do here. The first term is the effect on output. It's the productivity effect. And that's nothing but this here. This is the productivity effect. When I shift I to I prime, I am reducing costs. That's like a productivity increase. <clears throat> and that creates a derived demand for labor. If nothing else happened because the left-hand side has log, this would be a proportional increase in the wage bill and the labor share would remain constant. But the second effect is any change that happens through the labor share, and that's the one in the orange, which Pasquale and I call the displacement effect. The displacement effect is always negative because it's the fact that you're substituting capital for labor. Now, two important implications right away. One is, Automation, always and everywhere, no exception, nothing to do with the elasticity of substitution, nothing, it's not conditional on anything. It always reduces the labor share. So when Jan sees a labor share decline, he thinks of markups. When I see a labor share decline, I think of automation. Probably somewhere in between we can meet, okay? That's implication number one. Implication number two, is that an improvement in technology, which an increase in I is in this instance because it's reducing costs, can easily reduce the wage bill. So Jan was earlier on today, very rightly focusing on trying to get stagnant wages in unskilled, stagnant, uh, stagnant behavior of unskilled wages without technological regress. He was bang on target because in the standard framework that he was using with factor augmenting technologies, without markup changes, you'll never get stagnant or declining unskilled wages. They will always increase when you have a productivity improvement. And the problem is that that's not generally the case. And this framework explains why. The displacement effect can easily be larger than the productivity effect. So this is what I was, now we're seeing the two implications that I said I didn't like, I found weird about the factor augmenting canonical model. It links labor share declines to the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor. To me, that didn't make sense. And second, it predicts that improvements in capital productivity or improvements in productivity technology always lead to higher labor demand. Again, with markups not changing or monopsony power not changing. Again, that doesn't make any sense. But in fact, there's an additional corollary to this. In the popular press, there are many books written about AI and automation and new technologies, and they emphasize how brilliant, amazing, very productive technologies are going to take jobs from humans and spell the end of work. But in fact, this framework clarifies that the problem isn't brilliant technologies. Brilliant technologies will generate a large displacement effect, but they will also generate a large productivity effect. The, the double whammy for labor, and I'll come back to this again quite extensively tomorrow, 
is what Pasquale and I call so-so technologies. Technologies that are just enough to be adopted or sometimes even beyond. So they don't improve productivity much because the curve for the cost of labor and capital are very, very close together. So the productivity effect is minuscule, but they still generate a large displacement effect. So the real enemy of labor isn't brilliant technologies, it's so-so technologies. And contrary to what Krugman has been writing, the fact that productivity growth is slow doesn't signal that there is a slowdown of automation. On the contrary, it might actually be a sign of a lot of automation, but a lot of marginal automation. I'll come back to that as well. Now for contrast, let's look at what you would get if you look at a factor augmenting technological change. You have a productivity effect now uh, proportional to the labor share or the inverse of the labor share, depending on whether you're looking at capital or labor augmenting technology. And you have a task price substitution. But the problem is that the realistic estimates of sigma are very close to one. For example, in the work by Oberfield and Raval. So the task substitution effects are going to be minuscule. Now that has two implications. One, again, I might come back to this at the end. If you want to get realistic changes in labor share or inequality, you need huge improvements in productivity. You know, orders of magnitudes bigger than what we have if you're gonna stick to the canonical framework. One of the unpleasant implications of the canonical framework that has always been hidden. If you look at many of the papers that have used the canonical framework, they immediately jump to relatives. The canonical framework does well on relatives, but if you look at its effects on the absolute, it is violently rejected. And it's the reason is precisely this, that you need either huge technological regress or huge, 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 huge productivity improvements. So again, that's gonna be a problem that's not as much of an issue. So now let's, having introduced this new framework and linked everything to labor share, let's look at where the labor share declines come from. Let me start with uh, 40 years after World War II. And uh, Pasquale and I have aggregated data to six aggregate sectors, manufacturing, construction services, transport, mining, and agriculture. And critically, these are not labor shares in sales, but labor share in value added. Several people report labor share in sales. For example, if you look at firm level census data, but that's problematic because the share of intermediates has been growing over time. So everything that I'm saying here requires the labor share in value added. Now, this is a remarkable picture, except for mining, which is a relatively small sector, and agriculture, another really small sector. Labor share is fairly constant during this period within these aggregated sectors. Now, does that mean there is no automation? Well, that's not the case, and I'll come back to that in some detail tomorrow. But let's look at the period of the big declines in labor share. Same sectors. What you see is that actually <clears throat> a lot of the sectors where we instinctively think monopoly power has increased, such as services and transport, are fairly constant in terms of their labor share. Most of the declines in labor share come from two sectors, manufacturing and mining. Manufacturing has a whopping almost 20 percentage points declines in labor share in the course of about 20 years. Mining has even bigger, but mining is small, so that's not gonna be a very big contributor. So I'll come back to where within manufacturing and where in the economy. So what right here, what I'm doing is that I'm showing you just a scatter plots of different sectors change in labor share between 1987 and 2017, together with a number of their characteristics. There's nothing causal here. Uh, I'll move to some things that might be a little closer to causal later on. But on the left, top left here, I'm showing you the relationship between change in labor share and robot penetration. This is a measure that Pasquale and I have used, and I'm gonna come back to that in the next 10 minutes. Uh, the 
Diamonds are manufacturing, circles are services. Services are not using industrial robots, very little use of it actually. So it's really concentrate here just on the manufacturing. And you see a very strong relationship between robot use. Robots are the tip of the iceberg, but still they show a strong relationship. If you want to zero in onto manufacturing here, we go more detailed uh, from the survey of manufacturing technologies. And we are showing you the relationship between share of firms using automation technologies and, uh, <clears throat> and change in labor share just for manufacturing. And you see again, a very strong relationship. This is not causal, again, it's an association, but it is an interesting association. Here, I'm showing you share of routine jobs. So now we have the non-production, no, sorry, non-manufacturing sector also varying. Now the circles are varying and you see that both manufacturing and non-manufacturing industries show a negative relationship. The more routine tasks you have at the beginning, which again, is not a perfect measure of automation. I'll show you that in the next slide, but it is sort of indicative, the more labor shares decline. And then finally here, I'm showing you yet another competitor explanation, which is task-based also, but somewhat different, is offshoring. There is a relationship with offshoring as well, but it's not actually all that strong. And just to reiterate that, here I'm showing you the same things in regression form. At the bottom are the detailed manufacturing industries, 150 of them in uh, three three-digit uh, sectors. And on the top, you have the adjusted penetration of robots. And then I would like to sort of highlight this here that you, you want to control for competition from China or offshoring that doesn't really have much of an effect. Really, the changes in the task content, changes in the labor share are quite distinct from the Chinese import shock and offshoring and that you can see both at the detailed and the less detailed, but the routine share, as I said, is a little bit more shaky. Again, these are just correlations, but they are useful to have in mind. So if you wanna go beyond correlations, you wanna have a strategy for zeroing in what's the effects of robots. So I'm gonna do that now. Uh, let me skip this. Uh, well, actually, let me, let me just say that. Uh, if you look at, quantitative magnitudes, they're actually pretty significant as well. So one more robot per thousand workers associated with a 1% decline in manufacturing labor share. And uh, you know we have an increase in robot usage during this period of about 10 robots per thousand workers. So that explains about 10% of the 30% decline in the labor share. And since, as I pointed out, Robots are just one of many, many automation technologies, at least as a ballpark, it is quite possible that automation accounts for bulk of the changes in the labor share. But to dig a little bit deeper, now we want to estimate the effects of robots. Really, does it take this form of automation technologies? What does it do to wages, employment, and so on? So I'm gonna do that at two levels. First, for US data, drawing on a paper that I have with uh, Pasquale uh, on robots and jobs <clears throat> and local labor market effects, and then looking at the firm level evidence from France. So the key is going to be, which are the labor markets that are going to be more affected by robot introduction? And then for that, we define we derive from theory, but it's also very intuitive as it's a Bartik measure and exposure to robots. And it's given here at the bottom in words or in mathematics, it's a Bartik measure of the industrial structure of a local labor market and, uh, and where within what industries the robots frontier is moving. So this robot penetration, which in the theory takes this adjusted penetration of robots APR term, is measured not in the US, but in economies like uh, in Europe, which are more advanced than the US in terms of robot penetration. Okay. First, the reality check. Does exposure to robots predict robotics activity? 
Well, since at the time of writing of this paper, and at the time of today, actually, we still don't have access to the micro data on robots. Well, we, we sort of have access now, but just now in the US. So we can't use robot adoption, but we have data from an interesting paper by Nancy Lee and Corey Kraft uh, on the integrators. So you need integrators to install, calibrate, maintain, and reprogram robots. And there's a very strong association between our exposure to robots measure and the integrators. So where the exposure to robots is high is where the integrators are located. And the integration services are fairly non-traded. You don't get people from you know, Florida to come all the way to Connecticut to do the robot integration. So what does do, do robots do? Well, <clears throat> here is the local employment and robots. So on the horizontal axis is the exposure to robots. On the vertical axis is the change in employment in the private sector to population between 1990 and 2007. This regression may or may not control for, I mean, it does, it does control, but if it didn't control for any of this, it wouldn't look any different, but it controls for a lot of demographic baseline characteristics, Chinese imports, and lots of other things that you may be worried about. But all of these are fairly orthogonal to the exposure to robots, so it doesn't look very different. You see a very strong relationship that in places that have adopted more robots, you have much more negative employment. Again, very difficult to understand if you had a factor augmenting view of thinking, for example, of robots as capital augmenting technological change, but makes a lot of sense in this task-based framework. And you can recognize here the industrial heartland of the United States. So these are the places in the Midwest where heavy industry was located. Now you may be worried that these guys are driving the relationship so you can leave them out. If you leave them out, instead of the solid line, you get the dashed line. That looks very close. You may not, you need to squint to see the dashed line. So leaving those guys out is not really uh, affecting the relationship. Same thing now with local wages. Here covariates matter a little more because Demographic structure does matter for wage growth, but not not nothing significant. Again, whether you leave the industrial heartland art out or in doesn't make much difference. The dashed line is again essentially on top of the solid line. And then the final thing you may want to know is which are the occupations that are being influenced. And the answer here is that almost all of the effect comes from, oops. Comes from blue collar occupations. So in places where robots are being affected, it's the routine blue collar occupations that are being rep uh, uh, replaced by capital. Now, this is not all routine occupations. And if you were to use all routine occupations, you wouldn't get a very meaningful result because routine occupations are very different. Some of them are automated by numerically controlled machines. Some of them are automated by algorithms and databases or some uh, perhaps by some applications of IT, but these are very specific production tasks. There's also some spillover effects on services, locally provided services, which we sort of, go through in the paper, but I'm not going to dwell over it now. These results are very robust. I'm not going to go through them. You can control for lots of things and subsamples, etc. And they are very specific to robots. If you look at other measures, including computers or capital intensity or heavy capital, you don't see anything like this. It's really about automation. And also these places are, they don't show any pre-trends. So, uh, uh, all of the obvious things that you would you would you would worry about are fine, but the local labor market effect, though very relevant for many things that we care about, is not ideal for understanding the microstructure that I have already indicated. So we were clamoring to find firm level data for the last you know several years, and then finally over the last few years we did get the French data. And so let me show you a little bit on, unfortunately, somehow I pulled uh, <clears throat> the penultimate version of my slides for whatever reason, 
uh, it's a bit of a embarrassing. So I had put more of the references on, for example, for the task-based model, Zera's reference, and for this one, for example, the paper with Claire Lelarge that Pasquale and I wrote uh, in the AER papers and proceedings for which this material draws, but so that last references somehow were lost. So I pulled the wrong versions of the slides, but other than that, everything's fine. So I'll just say the references uh, in person in, in, my, in my words. So, so now I'm gonna show you stuff from firm level data using the French data, which Claire Lelarge has masterfully assembled and processed. And this is a very interesting data set in my opinion, because it's the closest thing to a comprehensive data on robot adoption that I have seen. Again, in the US, we are collecting it, but it's probably not gonna be as comprehensive as this one. So it's between 2010 and 2015 for French manufacturing. Only 1% of firms purchased industrial robots during this period, which we called from five different sources. <clears throat> Uh, so it's very important to use these different sources because not all robot purchases appear in a single source. So that was the huge amount of work that Claire did masterfully. And although these are 1% of the firms that purchased robots, these firms account for 20% of manufacturing employment. Actually, the size difference between robot adopters and non-adopters is sort of important, and I'll come back to that. So here is the uh, one look at the data. You see the share of total robot purchases by firm percentile. And you see that top 0.1% of firms by size are much more likely to adopt robots. But even more noteworthy is that there are essentially no robots being adopted by firms at the bottom of the six, uh, 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 in the in the 60 bottom percentiles of the size distribution. The other thing that you can see is that if you divide industries by high APR versus low APR, that was the adjustment penetration of robots that I mentioned, uh, you see that typically there is about 50% more adoption of robots in the high APR industries. Again, showing that it's the frontier of the robots going forward in terms of technology that's driving some of these changes. But there are also some conceptual issues we should think about in this context, because once you do it at the firm level, and this is related to uh, uh, the paper that John Van Rienen gave in the morning, as well as uh, Matthias's paper, firms that adopt robots or new technologies are going to reduce their costs, which means that they are going to expand. They're gonna expand in terms of value added and sales, but they may also expand in terms of employment. So to understand those things is, we look at the relationship that simultaneously that depends on your own robot adoption. So change in whatever outcome you want to have on the left, but also adoption of your competitors, which are the same firms in the same industry as you. <coughs> we define adoption by competitors to be the sales weighted adoption of all firms in your industry other than yourself. So here is what that data looks like or what that relationship looks like. Since time is short, let me focus on just the unweighted estimates. They're very similar. So let me start with this here. If you adopt a robot, your value added, the same is true for sales, but I'm just focusing on value added, increases quite a bit by 20%. But when your competitors adopt it, then your value added declines. So this is very much telling a story of 
you are gaining market share at the expense of your competitors. And this again brings issues that were already present in Jan and uh, Attila's papers, for example, market structure is key. And that's some of the work that Claire Pasquale and I are doing at the moment. Together with value added, employment changes in the same way. So if you are a robot adopter, your employment expands, but it's at the expense of your competitors. Now, I'm not showing you here just to keep it simple, but when you look at where that employment comes from, and this relates to Matthias's paper from earlier, all of that additional employment is non-production workers. So there's also a big shift in the composition away from production workers to non-production workers. And in fact, one way of seeing that, again, this goes back to our discussion of Jan's paper, there is a quite sizable effect on labor share. And as theory would suggest, that's just from your own robot adoption. Your competitor's robot adoption now doesn't matter and it shouldn't because that's not your production technology. Recap, robot adoption is associated with increases in firm employment, but significant declines in employment of competing firms. But even more important, everything is going through these shifts against labor through the labor share. Robot adoption is associated with the over four percentage point reduction in the firm's labor share. Robot adopters make up 20% of value added. So this explains essentially all of the labor share decline in French manufacturing industry. But once you have this firm sizes are changing, et cetera, that should remind you of papers that have been written over the last several years on superstar effects or composition effects, et cetera. Many of the people here have contributed to that. For example, Outer et al., uh, John Van Rien and Christina Patterson, David Dorn uh, and John on superstar effects. That's, they do one decomposition, actually. Uh, there are several decompositions one can do. They are all useful, but this one is sort of useful since they have emphasized it. And it's, it's, it's also going through it on French data will give me a opportunity to explain why I think that automation is much more important than people have until now presumed and changes in the labor share. So here is the decomposition of John Van Rienen and co-authors. Change in labor share is decomposed into two terms, a change in unweighted mean, which they call the within firm change, and then the residual, which they call a superstar effect, which is change in covariance between labor share and value add. So here is that decomposition in the US. And this mimics what they find that a change in labor share is about 0 0.8 percentage points, 0 0.7 percentage points. The within firm change is positive. And it's really this very negative superstar effect due to covariances that leads to, uh, to the decline in labor share. Now, there are many different ways of interpreting this covariance. One could be due to markups. Two could be due to <clears throat> the fact that large firms are more capital intensive and there is more value added reallocated towards them. Both of those are interpretations are prominent in Outer et al., for example. And of course, Jan's important work with Jan de Locker uh, also supports the markup interpretation. But actually, the French data, because we have the automation technologies, gives us a way of thinking about this in a original way. Now, I'm, what I'm doing is showing you, why is this not? Okay, oh, finally, it sort of looks cleaner. Now let's look at between adopters and non-adopters. So actually, the within firm change in labor share among non-adopters is positive, but the one within non-adopters is and almost two percentage points more negative than the within firm change among non-adopters. So it's really a very different picture between 
adopters and non-adopters. And the big effect is this covariance, again, which John and co-authors think of it as reallocation, is really towards adopters. But also differently than <clears throat> what might appear from the US data, there is no pure reallocation effect. So you can do a further decomposition. I'm not going to give the equations because I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I'll just give you the bottom line. The pure reallocation effect in French data is zero. And the reason for that is because robot adopters and non-adopters have exactly the same labor share to start with. So it's not that some firms more, were more capital intensive or had higher markups and output was reallocated towards them. So that's one reading of Outer et al, for example, that appears in the, in, uh, in the Baki and Farhi paper. But I think the French data doesn't support that interpretation. What's going on is both simpler and also calls for a somewhat different interpretation. You just have these very large firms that are not very different from non-adopters, especially in their industries. But when they adopt robots, they reduce their labor share. And because they're so large, that has a big effect. And because the decomposition we're looking at here is looking at the unweighted change in mean, all of that goes into the superstar effect. So it is indeed like these papers have claimed this change in covariance, but potentially it has a different interpretation than a pure reallocation based explanation. Again, all of this sort of making the case that we really need to think about changes in the task content of production when we view these labor share differences. Okay, finally, I wanna come back to inequality. So I started at the beginning by claiming that changes in the labor share are not important just for understanding the distribution of income between capital and labor, but they're also central for understanding inequality. Now that seems like a bold claim and probably I'm not gonna convince all of you, but at least I wanna make the case. And I'm gonna do that in three steps. First, I'm gonna show you using exactly the same strategy as I went through for the robots and jobs paper with local labor market effects that robot adoption, again, not all of the automation, just one that I can, we can measure has major effects on inequality. Then I'm going to show you why in a theoretical sense, we expect the labor share to be important. And then I'll show you that in an empirical sense, the labor share mediated changes explain the bulk of all of the inequality changes in the US. The bulk of the inequality, about 70%. All right. <clears throat> so here is the same regression framework that I went through with the local labor markets, but now rather than looking at employment and wages for all workers, I'm looking at it by education groups. So you can see that the effects are more negative on both employment and wages for workers in the low education categories and positive or not much for the highest education workers. This is a pattern we're gonna see at the aggregate level as well. So one of the slides that I had also added, unfortunately I, uh, from the, this is in the JPE paper, but again, because I'm using the penultimate version of the slides, I'm not able to show you that. We also look at the uh, percentiles of the whole wage distribution by local labor market. And we see that the robots affect all percentiles below the 30th. So they're concentrated in the middle and the bottom of the wage distribution. Why is that? Why is it the middle and the bottom? We have some other evidence that suggests that's because they directly replace the middle, just like the figures I showed at the beginning. But then these workers go and take some of the lower wage jobs, and then that creates the spillovers. And I'll come back to that exactly in a second now. Okay. So that's just 
evidence to say that these effects are real and you can see them in regressions, but how large are they and are they really mediated by labor share? You know, that here I'm looking at the robots, which I said in a different data sets, they affect labor share and they affect inequality. So to do that, what I'm going to do is, I'm now going to <clears throat> draw on some more recent work that Pasquale and I have, and now combine a heterogeneous version of the task-based framework. So it's exactly the same framework as before, except that, well, I'm just using different notations since now following a different paper, except that, you know, instead of sigma, the elasticity of substitution between tasks is lambda, but more importantly, now, a task can be produced by capital or different skill workers. So G here is skill group. Okay. Previously, when I was looking at just capital and labor, we had a line and tasks were as assigned either to capital or labor like this. Well, now it's a multi-dimensional space and task allocations are defined by these sets. In particular, <coughs> a task is allocated to capital if the cost of producing that task with capital is less than cost of producing it with any of the other types of factors, which are the skill groups G. And a task is allocated to factor G if the task of the cost of producing that, well, sorry. the cost of producing that with factor G, human factor G, is less than the cost of producing it with any other human factor, and it's also less than the cost of producing it with capital. And then in this extended framework, you have multi-dimensional gammas. There you had a single gamma, which was the ratio of these task content or the distribution of parameters. Now you have these many gamma gammas. But we can again think of everything as a visual, and I can do that only in three dimensions. So instead of a line, let's look at a surface and just focus on the case where we have two types of labor, H and L. So this is a, how a task allocation looks like. Again, convexity would follow from comparative advantage types assumptions. You don't need to make them, but it's natural to make it. So here, these tasks, are allocated to H, high skill, these are to L and these are to K. So now, what is automation? For example, automation that takes away tasks from unskilled labor would be that this frontier here extends into the TL space. And this is the displacement effect again. But this is the only the first round impact. Why? Because now these workers who were previously performing these tasks will have to go and perform these tasks. But that would reduce the, those task prices because of wage competition. So there will be potential ripple effects. Now the L workers might take some of the tasks from the H workers or some of them from capital, like here. This is of course most relevant when the automation takes away tasks performed by middle skill workers and the middle skill workers go and take away tasks from low wage workers, but I'm not showing you that here because again, I'm restricting myself to a two dimensional surface. Again, you can look at factor augmenting technologies, but they're not gonna be very useful and they don't seem to be that important except with one exception, which I'm gonna show you in the data. All right. So this is the framework. 
if you bought my earlier framework, this one should be quite intuitive, an intuitive extension. But what makes it work, or what makes it worthwhile, is the empirical application. So now I'm going to go from this model, following it very religiously, to an estimation framework. So in our work, we do this for a general value of lambda. And again, this is because my I'm using the old version of the slides that I didn't fix this, <coughs> this lack of pagination or mispagination was fixed on my uh, <coughs> latest slides, but somehow, actually, let me see whether I can show you. Uh, well, it doesn't matter. I'll just stick to those. Uh, <coughs> rather than waste two minutes trying to find the right version of the slides. So, but here for this talk, I'm going to simplify it and focus on the Cobb Douglas case where the elasticity of substitution lambda is equal to one. That doesn't change, it turns out, doesn't change anything, but it just makes things simple. And then I'm going to make two more assumptions. First, I'm going to assume. Again, this is very important, and this is where it connects to Jan's work as well as to Matthias's and Attila's work that we heard earlier today, or some of us heard earlier today. <clears throat> I'm going to assume that markdowns due to monopsony or markups due to market power are constant. They may be present, but they're constant. Instead, we have automation going on. So in particular, some of the tasks that were not feasible or not profitable to automate, capital now can do them. Second, <clears throat> we're going to assume that automation only affects routine tasks. So in particular, the task content for group G can be written. I haven't shown you this in the math, but it's true. It can be written as the sum of the task content coming from non-routine tasks and routine tasks. Routine tasks for production workers are the blue collar tasks I showed you that are being automated by robots. And for the non-manufacturing workers, they're the typical routine tasks as coded in Outer Levy and Murnane or the work that I did with David Otter in the Handbook of Labor Economics. And moreover, I assume that Non-routine tasks are not automated, <clears throat> and routine tasks are automated in exactly the same way. So all of the routine tasks that are performed in industry are automated in an equiproportionate manner. That's an assumption, but it's not a crazy assumption. Now, putting A1 and A2 together, and because we have lambda equals to 1 and markups aren't changing, the only way labor share can change is because of automation. Again, so our general work, our general framework doesn't make this assumption. We have capital labor substitution. We can control for changes in markups, et cetera, but I'm forgetting all of those things. So, but at the end of the day, it's the same thing in our at least empirical framework. Most of the labor shares are, uh, cannot be explained by other factors. So it's changes in automation. So that then gives us this equation here which is that <clears throat> the amount of routine task automation in an industry I is given by changing the labor share of that industry times or divided by how much of that industry's tasks are routine. And then for a group G, the first round effect on that group is going to be how much is it exposed to the routine tasks that are being automated. So what that's giving us is then a Bartik measure, which is that for each demographic group G, we take how much of their total income comes from routine tasks performed in an industry times that industry's labor share change. Okay. And now let me show you the data. This is <clears throat> I'm defining groups by five education groups, five experience groups, gender, and ethnicity. Okay. And you can see the different 
groupings by education level. So for example, <clears throat> the uh, blue, sorry, uh, green circles are workers with some college, but different circles correspond to different experience groups and gender and race or ethnicity. So what you see is that the more this task displacement measure, this here, is higher for that group, the lower is the change of that group's real wages between 1980 and 2016. And that's true within every education group. So the more exposed you are to industries where labor share is declining, the more your real wages decline. Of course, this is a reduced form bivariate relationship you might say, well, that's because there are other factors like gender biased or education biased technological changes. So I'm gonna to come to that. The same is true for gender also. The <clears throat> red circles are for women, blue triangles are for men. Within gender, you see a very strong relationship between task displacement and change in wages. And here is the regression. If you look at the bivariate relationship across the 500 demographic groups, you have a whopping 60% R square of this Bartik measure. But of course, that's just a partial, that's just a bivariate relationship. So other things might be going on. Here, we control for a bunch of those other things. So in particular, Perhaps the sectors you were in are expanding and there is a Bomol cost disease or some other forces. Or it could be that it's the labor share in general that's saying, for example, markups are changing in your sector. So this goes back to the question that I raised to Jan. When markups change and nothing else changes, that should affect all workers in that industry, both routine and non-routine. Whereas our task displacement is a critical interaction between routine and the labor share change. So here, therefore, I am controlling for the labor share change by itself without interacting. It doesn't matter, neither does this. And this is the, perhaps it's just routine share. Perhaps there is just routine bias technological changes in Matthias's paper. No, that doesn't seem to be the case either. All of these three variables, one of them is just a regular sectoral expansion and the other two are the component parts of the interaction that makes up this task displacement measure they don't matter by themselves. It's really this task displacement that's driving everything. But what I'm not controlling here for is any general education biased or gender biased technological change. So what if there is general factor augmenting technological change that <clears throat> college workers are becoming more productive? Okay, so that's what I do here. So now I am allowing for a differential, differential trend by gender and by education. So men are the omitted group for gender and less than high school is the omitted group for, uh, <clears throat> for education. And what you see is, let me uh, focus here, is that the task displacement measure is hardly changed. And none of these matter much. So there is no evidence that workers of a given education group are becoming more productive in all tasks. In a regression framework, and in the paper we do more structural things as well, but in a regression, simple regression framework, the major determinant of the changes in the wage structure across these 500 demographic groups is how much they are exposed to changes in labor share or the task displacement, especially for routine workers. Once you look to take that into account, all of these correlations with education go away. So if you take this literally, what it says is that the reason why the previous literature was finding skill bias technological change and interpreting that as educated workers are becoming more productive relative to less educated workers is simply because the task allocation of educated and uneducated workers are different and automation offshoring or other changes are hammering the tasks that less educated workers were concentrated in. 
And when we didn't take that into account, we reached the incorrect conclusion that this was to do with skill bias technological change. But at the end, I think it has very little to do with skill bias technological change. Education explains very little. All of these five education variables together have an R square, partial R square of 15% compared to about 40% for the task displacement measure. All right, let me conclude. I have introduced a new perspective for wages, employment, and inequality that's task-based. It's not completely new. It's drawing on work by Josie uh, Zera and uh, uh, David Otter, Levy, and Murnane, as well as my work with Zilibotti and, uh, and later with David Otter and Pascual Restrepo. And uh, <clears throat> it shows that labor share changes is the key nexus of how the labor market works. And then I've tried to show you that labor share changes have been really important. Certainly, monopsony and markups are important in the changes in labor share. But a critical part of the labor share changes is about automation. In the US, most of the labor share changes are in manufacturing. Most of them are in industries in manufacturing that have been undergoing rapid automation. And in France, where we see this directly, we can get a better sense of that. And for wage inequality, this seems to do much more of the heavy lifting than any type of skill biased measure. All right, let me stop here and take questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Darren. If we were all able to clap, we we I'm sure we would. Um, there's a couple of hundred people or, or so on uh, YouTube, um, and I've been taking some questions. Uh, we also have the speakers and chairs from the conference today. Uh, by the way, for those on YouTube um, who weren't at the co conference, um, who have joined us on the head of this, so if they want to raise some questions, think about it. We could even have a proper interaction, but we've only got a few minutes. I, I'll, there were a string of questions that came up on the Slido and um, I'm sure some of them you you answered. Um, one, um, what, what, one, uh, one was really going back to the, uh, the discussion of robots. And uh, in fact, Alex Bryson, colleague asked, um, what do we know about which firms are the first adopters of robots other than size? Um, and do the country differences you mentioned disappear within firm? I think that was uh, one question. I I'll tell you a couple of others. Um, there was quite a lot of interest in, uh, in how, how you think about what, what, uh, the, what, what we often think of is, re Ramin in fact raised the question, what do you think the recent technology, why do you think the recent technological developments have mostly had low productivity effects? Uh, what you would call so-so technologies. I guess these are somewhat tied up, um, tied up in a sense to the question, are, are these robots ever so-so technology or are they, are they always cutting edge? And somewhere in all this, you had robots at the, at the kind of cutting edge, I, it, uh, but we can come back to that. Maybe you'd like to, uh, think about those and while you're doing that I'll gather a couple more comments. Perfect. These are excellent questions. In fact, they are so excellent, well at least the latter two, that they are going to be the topic of tomorrow's lecture. <laughs> so tomorrow's lecture is going to explain, uh, or at least my interpretation of why we've had more automation lately, why automation lately has been low productivity, and what's the difference between good automation and bad automation, and why do we have good automation and why do we have bad automation, and, and why the how the future of work will depend on whether we have good automation or bad automation. So I can say much more on that. In fact, I have more than one hour of material, but let me leave that to tomorrow. Hopefully we'll come back tomorrow. In terms of who are the robot adopters, that's a great question. <clears throat> so we are looking into that using the richer US data right now. But in France, essentially we don't, other than size, not many things are great predictors. I'm looking at that question also in Danish data with Alex He. Uh, what types of managers and what types of firms. Uh, there are some determinants, but they're, they're not actually, there's a lot. I mean, in some sense, you know, think of this, the way I think of it is that size is a major determinant. Other than that, it's really like the flexibility or your business model is going to determine a lot of what you do with automation technology. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow as well. Mm, great. <laughs> for, for tomorrow, I'm sure we'll be back. Um, one of our students, uh, David, uh, on the market this year. David Zemplin Munro um, mentioned uh, or asked that, can you say more about, more on the endogeneity of automation to skill supply? Uh, 
I guess that's a, a common theme in lots of work and that might be useful to bring out. Um, I think that, yeah, that would, there's another kind of general one, which is really coming early on. And in some sense you dealt with it, but I expect it was lingering in many people's minds. Isn't the decline in manufacturing primarily due to globalization and offshoring of labor intensive jobs to low wage countries rather than automation? <laughs> so great, uh, great you, question. You a little bit with that, but why don't you? Uh, yeah. it, it, to so, so first of all, David, thank you very much. Yes, skill supplies will matter. So for the firm level stuff, they have access to the same skill. But tomorrow I'm going to show you that actually <laughs> skill supplies are not that important, but what's gonna be very important, well, not, education supplies is not gonna be that important. But what's important both across US local labor markets and across countries is the age composition of the labor force. And that really goes to the heart of what robots do, which is these semi-skilled manual tasks. And I'll talk a lot more about that. So some aspect of supply is very important. In terms of, uh, in terms of trade, so that's why I showed you that very briefly, and I've mentioned that twice, both in the cross commuting zone, local labor markets effects and the cross industry effects. And in both cases, the correlation between industry and import competition is essentially zero. And the reason for that is that if you look at where robots, well, this is not true for other types of automation, but if you look at where the robots are adopted, they're adopted in the heavy industries, which required semi-skilled jobs, so electronics, pharmaceuticals, car manufacturing, auto parts, whereas China trade affected more of these light industries, textiles, apparel, furniture, assembly, low skill assembly. So the two are very, very orthogonal. So that figure that I showed you, for example, with the across commuting zones, you wouldn't be able to see the difference if I did not control for uh, Chinese imports. That figure did control for Chinese imports because they're essentially orthogonal. So, <clears throat> so yes, I think Chinese imports are very important for understanding the labor market, but actually they don't affect the labor share. That's because like, offshoring does, but Chinese, that's a product market competition. If it's going to affect the labor share, they're going to affect through Yan's channels. Like, for example, because of that labor you know, product market demand is going to change, etc. But again, we find very little correlation between labor share and Chinese imports. That was the last column of that robustness table that I showed. So both from a theory point of view and from an empirical point of view, Chinese imports are important, but they're not, they don't seem to get to the heart of why there have been these critical shifts against labor in the US. Now, Quite interesting, perhaps it's different in other countries and I would love to know, but I haven't looked at the micro data for other countries. That's great. Are there any, I think I've covered the, the kind of main questions that came up on Slido. Um, I don't know whether the panel want to, the speakers and panel from the conference want to raise anything. We'll have plenty of time for that and it's excitement. We've got the whole thing tomorrow as well. Is there anything anyone would like? You can just chip in if you would like to. While you're to, you got work here on France, uh, on France, I think, in fact, I was debating with uh, John and Steve over, um, John Van Rien and Steve Machin uh, over the last few days about, uh, and Jan would have a, have something to say on this too, and Thomas Philippon, the, what exactly we, know, we think has happened to the Labour share in the UK, which uh, by most measures has stayed very stable. And, um, I guess in a, in a kind of trivial sense, you can put that down to the, the large impact you find on manufacturing, which happened much earlier actually in the, in the UK or to largely a, a bit earlier. But I think these are kind of key because we, we have seen, uh, of course, a large increase in earnings inequality, uh, but we haven't seen, uh, at least on these measures, such a decline but there's some controversy over that and its measurement. And I think that's, uh, you know, it's a pretty exciting uh, thing to try and delve into uh, exactly what could square with what. So perhaps we'll do that. Um, but yeah, so I think these cross country things are gonna be great. Okay, sorry, enough of me rattling on. That was absolutely wonderful, Darren. Um, thanks very much. We're all really grateful to you and uh, we, Really look forward to uh, tomorrow's uh, tomorrow's lecture and for the conference for those who 
are joining it. So thanks very much. Thank See you. you this tomorrow. was fantastic. And I'm looking forward to tomorrow as well. Great.